Hey, welcome back. Question two now, we're on two, um, which instructs us to read section two. And I've you'll see that I've split that off with some horizontal lines and I've put a tiny little subtitle, question two, on that um, extract section for question two. The exam board won't do that for you, but we're learning at the moment, so I've done that little bit of work for you. Um, so we're going to read section two in a moment because we're going to spend some of our time prepping up our answer. We are reading through four. What impression does the writer give the reader of the stepfather? So we are interested in what we are led to believe and led to understand about the stepfather. What impression do we get of him? We are instructed, you should include what the writer tells us about the stepfather. Well, we are definitely going to be putting in five to seven quotes. So we will know what the writer says about the stepfather. And then we're also asked to interact with the language that the writer uses to create impressions of the father. Now, this is where some of the pieces I've marked on the Winston Smith piece last week just fell apart a little bit because they didn't really, for the impressions questions, pick up on what the language was doing okay in each individual piece of evidence they could say overall what the language did but they didn't get that nuance and detail from each individual piece of evidence so we're really going to focus on that um and we need some good vocabulary don't we for impressions this, this is judgment vocabulary where we judge a character so let's have a look let's do the reading prep now. Now we know that we have 10 minutes to do this question because it's a five mark question and we um, divided up the 50, every 10 marks deserves 15 minutes of time on this exam but this is only a five mark question and it follows question one. Question one we can usually do fairly quickly in five minutes which just gives us 10 minutes then to do this more complex task okay so what i'm going to do i'm going to we're all going to start this off together so we're going to do some of the reading preparation together uh, and then i'm going to just time you on here just to let you know the timings it'll stop you breaking off to getting your phone timing and the such like and trying to kind of cheat your way out of time which just won't work in this exam um, we're going to do the first bit together. I'm going to tell you when the three minutes writing, uh, reading prep is up. Uh, then I'll shout you the four minutes, then I'll shout you the five minutes. But if you have done after three minutes, or if you've done after four, then scooch the video along to find where we pick up again. Okay, so section for question two. And I'm looking for impressions of the stepfather. Okay, so... It starts with, I suspected he was around to stay. Now, that gives me the impression, certainly, that she didn't want him to be around because that word suspected, really, we only ever use that when we um, don't want something to happen, but we think it is going to happen. So if she suspects he was around to stay, then it would suggest that certainly she doesn't like him she doesn't want him round for some reason okay so in my head as i'm reading in under exam pressure i'm not absolutely clear whether i've got an impression of him or her there uh, that our narrator andrea so what i'm going to do is i'm going to underline the word suspected um but i'll probably use the quote i suspected he was around to stay I am going to put the word reluctant, that she was reluctant, that's my annotation, to have him about. But I'm going to have a think. I'm going to think, ooh, is there really much stronger evidence about the impression that I get of him? So far, the impression I have is that she certainly didn't like him. And because I tend to trust the narrator, I think that I'm not meant to like him either, okay? So, I've done a little bit of prep there. I suspected he was around to stay, underlined. 
I've annotated reluctant, but I've also thought to myself, I might be able to find better evidence. Okay, then I'm going to move on. So I suspected he was around to stay when huge paintings of ships, sails billowing, began to line the staircase. So I get the impression he's moving in and he is taking over the space of the family. Okay, so huge paintings of ships began to line the staircase. Now notice I can not write out sails below and I can just put dot 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 there to show that I've missed a little bit of the quote out that's not relevant to us. Um, and I will quote when I write it up, huge paintings of ships began to line the staircase. My impression takes over quickly. Okay. So there's two. I'm certainly happy about that second one. And I know when I write that up, that that is definitely an impression that I have formed of him from what I have been told. So I'm happy with that one. I might well start there when I do my write up. So, Let's imagine that I have taken 30 seconds to find those two in the exam. So the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to time you two and a half minutes to have a look through the rest and see if you can get up to seven pieces of evidence and seven annotations to just say what's the quick impression. After that, if you need the fourth minute and the fifth minute, that is absolutely fine. But I'm just going to give you your timing so that you can decide what you need to do for yourself as a learner. Okay, I will be, you'll hear me clicking away and kind of underlining away. And I might even be just saying a few things under my breath as well while we're having a first look through together. Okay, so I'm going to start that two and a half minutes now. just over a minute keep going if you can when you're underlining a longer quote decide what you're going to focus in on as a zoom word We've got 10 seconds left if we're aiming to do our initial reading in three minutes. No, I'm telling a lie. We've had two minutes of that. You've got another 30 seconds. Okay, so that's two and a half minutes. Keep going if you need to. We've used up three minutes of our time so far. I need to keep going. So don't worry if you're not done at the three minutes. Neither am I.
So it's four minutes gone. Thirty seconds left if you're going to take it up to five minutes but once we hit five minutes we are going to stop okay so interesting I don't know that I'm going to use that first one that I spoke about. I've got others that I think I probably like more. So just have a look at what you got. Underline with me if you want to. You can pinch some of my critical judgment words if you need to. Um, I know lots of you have got far better judgment words um, than I might use right now. Absolutely fine. We're all different human beings. We judge people slightly differently and we label those judgments slightly differently. And that's that's fine, that's okay, that's good. But if you hear a word that you like that I'm saying that isn't in your vocabulary, then maybe try to, to exercise using that. Okay, so having a look at the extract then, I went on to underline huge paintings of ships, sails billowing, began to line the staircase. And remember I said I would miss out sails billowing. I would have the phrase huge paintings of ships, began to like dot 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 began to line the staircase suggest he takes over quickly i would try when i write it up to add a second thing in um, and he might feel dominant in the house and then i'd pull stop when i write this up um so that's a nice one i can get i know i can get two suggestions out of that one when i write that one up the next thing i underlined um, pregnant mother strained on tiptoe to hammer and then what I did is I double underlined pregnant because I wanted that to be my Zoom word and the verb strained. So I double underlined strained as well. So let's deal first of all with the long quote. Pregnant mother strained on tiptoe to hammer. Now I know from the rest of the quote she's hammering pictures in, onto the wall, those, those big huge paintings. But my interest is that he lets her do that. She's pregnant, poor woman, um, and she's straining on tiptoe. So it says to me he is a selfish man. That's the impression I get, letting a pregnant woman do that. He could have done that himself. So I would write that up really tidily to say um, the phrase pregnant mother strained on tiptoe to hammer suggests that the father is selfish with the adjective pregnant emphasizing that she should not be doing this type of work if she can avoid it and the verb strained, suggesting it was a difficult thing for her to do. And he is less of a man for not doing it himself. So there's the impression that he's less of a man for allowing um, her to do it. Other, other ways I could say that, he seems unkind, we've had selfish, self-centered, He's not chivalrous, which means he's not um, gentlemanly. Okay. And then I underlined new wedding snap squatted on the sideboard and I double underlined squatted. I'll tell you why in a moment. So let's stick with the long quote. New wedding snap on the sideboard. Well, it's a new wedding snap has is he the sort of man that takes decisions quickly so one way we could describe somebody who does things quickly without too much thought is they are rash r-a-s-h that they step into things too quickly he doesn't think before he acts 
he's willing to rush things. So these are all um, impressions. Now it's, it was the 70s, there was much more expectation that people would get married before they had children. Not always, but there was more of an expectation in the 1970s. So, you know, we could say that he tried to do the right thing as well. We might not be, want to be quite so cruel to him in our impressions that he was trying to do the right thing by marrying Andrea's mother. So the child would be legitimate, was the belief at the time. And then that word squatter, that word squatter has a kind of a dark connotation for me that even the picture looks a little bit unhappy that it's kind of squatting, squatting down, cowering down, that there's something about this man insisting that they get married quickly that is a little bit frightening or he's a little bit dominating. Okay, so there's our impressions that he might dominate, he might be frightening, he could be rash, he could rush into things. He could be trying to do the right thing. There's plenty there. You wouldn't have time to write all of those in the exam. And certainly the exam board are not wanting you to be that thorough. Give them a couple of things, two, three if you can, and move on. If you can, look at the Zoom word squatted and say why that suggests that there's a little bit, something a little bit frightening about him, then that's absolutely fantastic. That will grade you higher. Okay, then I moved on, I read along. So that wedding stuff is in a heavy wooden frame. So what in terms of the father? Our mother was standing in front of a brick building, not a church. Now, maybe the mother is standing in front of a brick building, not a church, but if she's getting married, the, um, the father's there too. Um, it's not a church that my dog is digging on the sofa, if you can hear that. <laughs> noise that's she's trying to get herself comfortable it ruins sofas hey oi oi lay down sorry about that um okay so not a religious man maybe it's worth just a very quick one isn't it a very quick uh, statement if i'm trying to track the text um i would put um the description, not a church, suggests he wasn't a religious man. Full stop, and then I would move on. Because I don't want to make a lot of that one. Okay, so I'm gonna read along with the tall new man. If the tall is a fact about him, but you, I think you need to be careful. You know, what impression can you make of somebody being tall? It's starting to get into prejudice stereotype judgments, isn't it? Um, saying that somebody's body shape makes them a certain person. So I would I ignored tall because it's literal. Um, I'd be wasting my time saying um, the tall new man suggests he was tall or suggests he, he had height. I'm not going to grade highly with that. Okay, so I'm going to miss that out and save those seconds. I could have written that for something that's going to grade me higher. Let's keep moving. Both of them were trying to smile. Now, I thought that was very telling, actually. Trying to smile. It's true of the mother and the father, but I'm only asked about the father. So he was trying to smile. It belies, doesn't it, that he was not particularly happy on his wedding day. So maybe he was willing to enter into a marriage that he wasn't committed to. Was he foolhardy? Is that a cruel thing to do? Um, is it an optimistic thing to do to hope for the best? It doesn't really matter as long as it's possible and reasonable, your impression. Okay, so trying to smile. It's that word trying, isn't it, that gives it away. That something about him was having to force happiness, that he actually was not happy, he was not committed. Okay, so you've got some nice impressions, words there from me, and I'm sure that you might have some even nicer ones of your own that you'd like to use to describe your impression of him. Okay, so he's trying to smile while her dress ballooned in front. Before the baby was born, our stepfather, Peter Hawkins, Again, we're getting some facts about him and, and, you know, if you're struggling with this passage and thinking, I don't really know what's going on, then these might be some of the little bits that you do want to, to take hold of. It's difficult to get an impression from somebody's name, though. Okay. Um, but 
if he, if the only thing you put was that he was tall and he was called Peter Hawkins in this answer, you would get one mark. Okay, and one mark is better than zero marks. So if you do find this passage difficult, then that's what you should do. If you have other things to say from the other evidence that I've looked at, that is even better. But don't forget, writing something usually gets at least one mark. So go for it if you have to, but learn to avoid that sort of thing if you can. All right, so Peter Hawkins, and he used to, and then I started underlining, lug home bulging sacks of misshapen mojos for my sister and me. And if you scroll down to the bottom, because you can see the little asterisk there, scroll down to the bottom, it tells you that mojos is a chewy, sweet, wrapped in paper. I remember these from the 1970s because I am about as old as this writer and spearmint mojos were my absolute favourite. So if you are looking to bring me a sweet treat, I would welcome spearmint mojos. Okay, so isn't, that seems quite nice, doesn't it? That he lugged home bulging sacks of misshapen mojos. So there's something there that says, actually, he's willing to um, try and please Andrea and her sister, that there is some kindness within him. Now, the more perceptive of you might start to look at that language. Um, the kindness comes from he's lugging them home. Well, they're bulging sacks. So maybe they were quite heavy. Maybe they were awkward to carry. We're going to say that that shows some kindness, maybe. But look again, because the more perceptive of you are going to see some other things as well. Look home, bulging sacks of misshapen mojos. So he's not bringing them mojos that are absolutely pristine and new, like the ones you would get in the shops. They are misshapes. Nothing wrong with misshapes. I love a misshapen biscuit myself. I've got a cup of tea here. I would love a misshapen biscuit to dunk into it, but I don't have any at the moment. Um, so, he's bringing them gifts, but the gifts, you know, maybe aren't as pristine and lovely and as brand spanking new and as perfect as um, they would have liked. So there's, a, there's an act of kindness, but also <laughs> there's something that, you know, it's not all that it seems, is it? It's not as good as it could be, this gift. Okay, so I'm describing to you <clears throat> what is happening. I haven't used an impression here other than he seems that he can act kindly at times. But then when I look again, lug home suggests it was kind of a bit of a hassle for him to lug it home. He looked at it, it was a bit like, for goodness sake, I've had to carry something heavy. So, um, was it, a, you know, just was he trying to buy them a little bit with some um, some kindness? Remember, he's their new stepdad. Oh, the children will like me if I bring these sweets home. Okay. Um, so maybe he tries to buy them. Maybe he isn't all that he seems. Maybe that he actually finds it a bit tedious. Um, that it's a bit of what we call cupboard love. He doesn't really love them but he's trying to kind of show them, you know, a little bit of kindness. So make something of that. Um, he tells them that the mojos were off the back of a lorry. Now, if you didn't know, you might be very earnestly and honestly writing about that and going, oh, you know, he got them off the back of a lorry. Um, well, that's not how we use the phrase in the English language. So this is one of those pieces of what is called idiomatic speech. It's an idiom. Um, so you could put that, the idiom, fallen off the back of a lorry. But it tells you at the bottom, it's an expression to say that goods had been stolen and then sold on. It comes from the idea that a box could fall off the back of a lorry and someone could find it and sell the contents as, oh, lucky find. But the idea is that it's very unlikely the goods were found honestly. So it might be that the delivery driver, you know, kind of went, oh, there, I'm delivering 20 boxes that won't miss one, they won't count them, and then I'll sell those on down the pub. Okay, so it's that sort of idea that there's something a bit dodgy about them. So if he's brought these two lovely little girls, some sweeties, great stuff, 
but he also kind of goes nudge nudge wink wink hey look at you look at this guys I, I came across them accidentally look at the lucky find but actually it's a lie isn't it he has found he's really just dealing in stolen goods okay so my impression of him is he's willing to break the law he's willing to get something cheaply and offer it as a gift He let the sweets spill all colours onto the carpet. Now, just imagine this man doing that very act, because I underlined this. That idea of, hey, look at me, I'm bountiful. I've brought you these brilliant things and I'm going to cover the carpet in sweets. That's exciting for a child, isn't it? Usually you get a stingy little bag, don't you, of sweets from your mum, because she's looking after your teeth or your dad. But this guy goes, hey, I brought all this stuff and it's all over the carpet and it must look amazing to you when you're six. Um, so, I get the impression that he does try to make things exciting for them as well. So he's quite a complex character, isn't he? They might be stolen, but equally, it would be exciting if you were six, if there were sweets, the sweets just spilled all over the floor in all sorts of colours. What an exciting thing that he's created for them there. So he just tried to create excitement. Um, some of the more perceptive of you might say that, you know, he he makes things look too exciting. He overexcites them. He kind of promises. It's a false promise that life with me is always going to be like this. Okay, so. And that was the last underlining that I did because then it shifts to the girls. Okay, so there's plenty to go at there. If you've been listening and jotted down some of the words and phrases and suggestions that I use, you are now more than ready to spend, depends how long you took on the reading. So in the underlining, if you spent three minutes, write up for seven. If you spent four minutes, write up for six. If you spent five minutes, the time you've got left for writing up is five minutes. Okay, just a reminder, you know that there's some very, very quick ways of doing this. You've been asked to look at the language. I've looked at some of the language on, all along. The verb squatted, the adjective pregnant, the verb strained, trying, which is a verb. Those were the language um, bits that I zoomed in on. We've looked at an idiom there as well. We've got some dialogue that he uses. Um, so there's lots and lots of things that you can say about the language. Don't just fall into the habit of saying the phrase, the phrase, the phrase. Okay, so good luck and I will see you very, very soon for tackling question three. Now go and smash it for your gorgeous English teachers.